I stay bout it, I'm not pouting Break through walls and climb it mountains If you want it, scream it loud And show this world what they've been doubting Never waiting on the world to catch up to me Leave it in the rear view I wish that it was up to me The world would never fit Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Brain Tainment Podcast. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Today, I'm very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Haley Watson, clinical psychologist and program developer and creator of Open Parachute, an online video-based mental health curriculum uh, for teens and young adults with separate resources for students, parents, and teachers. And we'll unpack that a lot more throughout this chat today, of course. She really is doing some brilliant work in the youth mental health space helping these young people develop to their fullest potential uh, with what are really practical and evidence-based strategies. So look, whether you're 13, 15 or, or 42 right now, it doesn't matter. I know you're going to get some value from this chat and I know I'm really excited to learn more myself. So with that said, thanks for carving out some time and joining me for a chat today, Haley. Of course. I'm really happy to be here. So to kick things off, uh, look, I'm really fascinated by the backstory of people, how they get to where they are and, and why they work in the space that they're in, particularly folks like yourself. You know, you've carved out a career uh, in the mental health psychology space, such an important space to, to work in and, and add value to um, and really committed to helping people. So look, I, I'm somewhat familiar with your story, but just to set the scene for the rest of the chat, could you perhaps give us a snapshot of um, how you end up here wanting to do the work that you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways that we could look at that, but I guess I'll go back to the beginning because I feel like all of our stories start in childhood. You know, what are our experiences? How do we feel about those experiences? And are those, those experiences really shape how we view the world. You know, as we know about the childhood brain, you know, the first few years of life are very formative. And so for me growing up, I'm Canadian and I grew up in a very small town, beautiful, peaceful, small town in Canada. And I had this really scary, bizarre um, experience where my house was bombed with dynamite um, five different times over the period of a year and a half when I was between two and four years old. So, and they still don't know who it was. They kind of did a, you know, unsolved mystery shows about it. They, they, it was a, it's a, you know, one of those cold case files where someone just targeted my family. And so the first bomb went off. Um, we were taking my brother to kindergarten and, you know, the, the front passenger seat exploded and we had no idea why. And then a few months later, the side of our house exploded in the middle of the night. So my early years were really fearful. And because of that, and of course, you know, at that time, you know, my parents took me to, I think, an art therapist a couple times. And, you know, I think I drew a picture of, you know, the bad guy and cut it up. And <laughs> that was that was the end of that. And, you know, I didn't really think about it as I got older, but it permeated my reality. You know, I was terrified at night. I couldn't, I had awful nightmares. I couldn't sleep. Um, and then in more subtle ways, I just was scared all the time. And it's still, it's something that I feel very regularly. It's just, I have a very easy startle fear response, but I learned to mask it because that's what you do when you're a kid, you know, how are you going to fit in? So I, I really covered it over with a sense of bravado and a sense of like bubbly and happiness and just had these feelings buried the whole time. And it wasn't until I was a lot older. Um, and then of course, when I was a teenager, my parents got divorced and my mom moved to another country. So that threw me and I sort of felt a lot of abandonment and loss. Um, but it really wasn't until I was an adult when I started, you know, sort of looking and going, what am I doing with my life? Why am I, why do I keep, for me, it was always relationships. That's what really started breaking down. Why do I keep getting into these relationships and then destroying them and literally blowing up these relationships? If you look at the parallel, you know, what, what is happening with this? And finally got into therapy and finally started going, oh, those things that I went through impacted my thoughts, my feelings, and, and that, and so I, I'd always been passionate about working with teenagers all along the way, but that's when it really landed when I said, oh my goodness. Now, if I had had these tools, if I had just been able to link these dots and to know that it was okay, that I could label that fear and I could feel that fear and I was safe to feel that fear, mm. imagine what I could have done and, and, and look at what I can do now, now that I know that. So that was kind of the the real journey that that led to my my strong passion to help young people. 
Yeah, well, wow, makes sense. Um, and there's a there's a lot in there to unpack. That is, <laughs> I, I was familiar with that story of with um, with the bombings. That that is super crazy. And you know, you probably know more. Well, you would certainly know more than I do. A lot of the research coming out of um, the impact, uh, you know, of, of these circumstances and emotional states at such an impressionable age. And we'll get to that in a moment because I really want to go deep into that. I find it super fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you just touched on it there. You know, the value in um, and you talk about this a lot. Allowing ourselves. Um, to feel and essentially just reconnecting to our emotions. Um, there's yeah. a lot to unpack in that itself. But firstly, uh, what are some of the benefits to, to that practice, I suppose, for, for people listening, whether they're a teen or an adult now, yeah. that practice of, of connecting and, and being more aware of our emotional states? What are sort of the real world benefits of doing that? Yeah, beautiful. Such a good question. So I, I like to speak about my own personal experience because I feel like it makes it really relevant. So in my experience, when, when we don't connect to what we're really feeling, which is something that's hard in our culture. And it, it sort of seems a bit, you know, connect to what we're feeling seems a bit like, what does that even mean? Right. But what it means is that most of the time when we go through life, we're, we're trying to shut things down. You know, we do that in a lot of ways. Like if we're stressed, we'll have a drink or if we're tired, we'll have some coffee. If we get in an argument with a friend, we'll avoid that friend because we don't want to feel that, you know, we're, we're pushing things down a lot because it's uncomfortable to feel. And when we do that, it's like, it's almost like a really good analogy. I think my dad told me this analogy. It's like, we live in this huge mansion. And every time we have an uncomfortable experience, we close a door and we, we progressively lock ourselves in a smaller and smaller space until we're like sitting in this closet in this giant mansion because we're too scared to go anywhere. We're too scared to see that person because it might make us feel anxious. We're too scared to say that thing because it might make us feel insecure. We're too scared to wear that thing because it makes us feel vulnerable, whatever it is. And so when we get comfortable with our feelings and we, we practice sitting with them, we practice going into them, what it gives us is freedom. It gives us the, the ability to become our fullest expression of self and be empowered and, and just follow what we want and who we want to be rather than making decisions based on our fear, which we don't even realize we're doing. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree um, aggressively. Um, and <laughs> so again, we could go a whole host of different directions, but I want to talk about Open Parachute, a really interesting program targeted towards um, some of the mental health challenges and behavioral challenges of, of, of teens, I believe. So could you expand a bit more on how this came about and why you thought it made sense, made sense to, um, to work with that age group? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I, I've always been so interested in working with teenagers. And I think because for me, I, you know, I struggled as a teenager. And, and I think to be perfectly honest, I had this realization the other day, I was like, I think I just spent a really long time being like a teenager, <laughs> even after I wasn't a teenager. So I because it took me so long to resolve some of these, you know, behaviors that I was exhibiting that were quite adolescent and the way I was thinking but I really relate to that age group a lot. And it's so important and powerful because at that age, we're capable of so much. We have so much energy. We have so much, you know, our whole life is changed by the decisions we make when we're a teenager. And as we, as we sort of enter into the world and yet we have, you know, it's such a confusing time and it's so overwhelming and, you know, everyone in adolescence has some sort of confusion of identity crisis or who am I or what am I supposed to do? And when we can, you know, take teenagers through this powerful process of becoming in touch with, you know, who they are and what they want to do and who they want to be and not limiting themselves, you know, you know, not only is that so powerful for them, but I really believe that's what will change the world. You know, if we have a whole generation of teenagers that can express themselves vulnerably, can set boundaries, can make empowered choices, you know, what kind of a world are we going to live in? So mm. that was the exciting part in terms of teenagers. And then with Open Parachute, um, as you know, it's based around documentary videos of real teenagers that are sharing their own experiences. And that really came about because what I realized, and this is true for all of us, but especially teenagers, that in order to do this work of reflection and self-awareness, it has to feel safe. 
And in our culture, it doesn't feel safe because nobody's talking like that. And when you look on social media, for the most part, there's a there's an image of perfection. And we do that in general in our society, you know, like people, we all just like what I did, we, we pretend to be happy because we think that everyone else is happy. And so what I found is that when teenagers hear from a peer and they hear in their own language with the words they would use, this is how I feel, this is how I think, this is what I did, and this is how I overcame it, that's what creates that safety. And so we really, and it, so it's not just the peers as well, it's we really curate those. So it's a really tailored journey and story that we're taking kids on. So we're really taking them on this journey of this is the discovery and this is, and then helping them reflect on that with a series of exercises and discussions of, okay, this is what you just saw. This is what this means. How can you relate to that? And then we use, you know, psychological skills building exercises, which is essentially what someone would do if they went to therapy, but most people don't go to therapy. So we're, we're generalizing this so that everybody gets this lesson, these lessons in a classroom setting. Yeah, sure. That's awesome. Uh, I actually, I remember reading uh, as I was diving into your world about, um, you know, the, the the documentaries that these teenagers create and sort of create, it just automatically gives you a sense of um, this is the norm, I suppose. We're talking off air about, you know, making important conversations um, more prevalent, I suppose. And I remember reading and thinking, oh, that's, that's a really good idea. It's a really cool strategy. And then I actually saw a couple of the example videos. Uh, I think they might be on your website or various platforms. And thinking to myself, holy shit, this is fucking epic. Part of my language. This is really good. And, and particularly as a teen, this would be so relatable and really usable. Um, so I think it really hit me at, a, at like a um, limbic level, if you will. Um, and that's as a, you know, as a 31 year old now. So I, I would imagine if a teens, particularly if they're struggling with anxiety, depression, comparison issues, we touched on social media there. Um, that that would be a really interesting way for them to to relate, and it's almost like yeah. tapping into this need for humans to to be part of a group, right? To be social, and that's yeah. half the challenge. Like you're just outlining about, it's yeah. not the norm to kind of be more expressive and things like that. So, have you found that that um, that that particular process has allowed more people to whether it's open up or connect emotionally or just be yeah. a little bit more authentic? Absolutely, absolutely. And so we really, you know, when I was first creating the program, I did some trials where I would go into classrooms and just try to run some sessions of, okay, let's just do some exercises. Let's do some reflection. And, you know, you can hear a pin drop. <laughs> Nobody wants to share, but because of the way we create these videos, as you've seen, we really put a lot of effort into what they're seeing all of a sudden. It, it's amazing. It just feels safe. It's like, it's like one. And also I think the world kids grow up in now, they're so used to seeing people on screen. And I always wonder if that plays a role. Like, I wonder if this would have, this particular medium would have been as effective in, you know, in our generation when we were in school. And I think right now, because they're so used to that, they see, and, and then they get this journey. And then all it takes is one person in the class to feel safe enough to say, yeah, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to share a little bit, or that makes sense to me. And then the whole class feels safe. So it's, it's really, really exciting the, the, that, that space that we create. And then it's really supportive and helpful for teachers because they don't have to become the expert, you know, which is what the burden that's placed on them a lot of, okay, now I have to be on top of everything else. Now you want me to be a counselor, a therapist. Right. And so it's like, no, no, you just facilitate. You don't need to be the expert. You can just be the one that really validates their process. Hmm. I wanted to, to highlight and draw attention to some of the culprits that get in the way, I suppose, from a societal point of view. And um, we've touched on you know, social media. I want to go a bit deeper on this. So this is something that I've probably become a lot more interested in, if you will. And the more I realize the impact that, um, that these things can have. So um, let's first just draw attention to what some of those big culprits are. So what have you seen from experience and the work that you do and your studies um, have been detrimental, particularly in the, in the youth space where we are so impressionable, what are some of the big issues that um, cause people to feel anxious, to feel disconnected, to feel insecure, things like that? That's a really great question. And it's such a big question, really, because- There's a lot, right? There's a lot. There's so yeah. much, there's so much. And I, I would say, here's how I would like to answer this. I would say that when we're young, we all go through challenging things. We all have our own version of a story, whether that's just- you know, something like a trauma or, or a loss, 
or it's just that, you know, our parents were really busy and they didn't really see us in a way that we, we felt like we wanted to be seen. Whatever it is that's going on, that creates, you know, a challenge for us. Our, our minds adjust, as we talked about, our minds sort of, you know, shift and, and try to figure out how to, how to cope with that. And then I think the biggest, so that's something that sort of gets in the way and creates a, a hurdle, but almost bigger than that, I feel like the biggest thing that gets in the way is that we're so scared of triggering kids. We're so scared of making kids upset. We're so scared of emotions in kids that we don't create the space or allow them to, to feel and process what they're going through. And we don't validate their experience often because we're so busy for figuring out what we're supposed to be doing. You know, it's really hard, you know, anyone, whether it's parenting or teachers or anyone that comes into contact with the child, you know, life is busy, life is full, we, you know, and, and, you know, if a child is upset, we just want to make them happy. You know, we have this cultural obsession with happiness. And so, you know, a child will say something like, you know, I'm worried that you're going to get divorced to parents, for instance. And the parents, of course, will say, no, 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 you know, don't, don't worry. That's never going to happen. Meanwhile, the child is picking up on a reality, you know, mm, let's yeah. first say, you know, this is just one example. It's not always the case, but kids pick up on everything. And they're and probably we, drawing I'm, their own meaning from that, that I imagine. Is, it all and, went wrong, but they're it, that's right. But what we what we fail to take into consideration is usually often kids are right. <laughs> often kids are more right than we are because they're so honest. Right. They just see what's there and they they just call it like it is. You know, if you ever want to know what an outfit looks like, ask a kid because they'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> looks terrible. <laughs> you know, I can see that fat roll, you know, whatever it is, right? They'll, they'll tell you. And so they just pick up on this honest reality of like, this is what's happening for me or I don't like the way that feels. And then that's really hard for us as a culture to kind of take in because we want them to feel happy. We want to protect them. So in essence, we kind of lie to kids a lot, you know, not that we're meaning to, but you know, we're often lying to ourselves too. We're creating this reality that we think will keep them safe. And so they grow up and they have all of these challenges and then they feel like they can't trust their own emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets in the way is that they don't trust themselves. And so they don't have the resilience tools to move through things because they don't even know what's going on or what they're feeling or why it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that is probably reinforced by like this need to take the path of least resistance almost. I remember reading somewhere it's like, and I, mean, I feel like it can be tailored to all kinds of situations. There was something on the lines of, you know, if, if you if you want to pursue something, like it was in relation to like a goal of some sorts, but I imagine it's the same for like behavior change or, or, or a certain emotional state. If you want to pursue something, you need more energy required. You need to want it more than your reptilian brain wants to chill or something like yes. that. So it's like this, if we're just left to our own devices, we're going to take the path of least resistance. And if, yeah. if, um, yeah. if it's not encouraged at an earlier age and supported and, and reinforce mm -hmm. then yeah you get mm -hmm. to adulthood and then the idea of um starting to explore some of those emotions so you can do something with them and you're not in this just kind of surface level state that's not quite fulfilled um yeah. it's too, it's almost too scary and you'd rather just exactly you know, have, a, have a drink or have a have whatever it is Exactly. Just keep the status quo, you know, mm. and so there are a lot of adults and we were all doing this, you know, there's no fault or, you know, to anyone, but it's really hard to live our live a true life that we want to live, be empowered, you know, because it means letting people down. It means having people think you're being rude or it means, you know, leaving relationships. It means leaving jobs. It means all these things that are like earth shattering. Mm. And when we don't have the, you know, when we don't know our own feelings, you know, that those feelings are way too big. Yeah. You know, so that's when we put ourselves in the box. Is that, a, is that largely, do you think due to like, and I imagine some of the, particularly as a teen, um, like some of the challenge, like it's this longing to, to not be judged. Uh, and if, yeah. if you have a, a child and then obviously throughout their life, if it isn't, you know, work through who for whatever, maybe they weren't loved as a child, or at least what, what that meant to them, they didn't experience, um, or they had something traumatic take place um, that they didn't work through. You know, I, I feel like that, that fear of judgment is something that I see 
um, from so many people. And it comes a lot, up a lot on this show from different people I work with, uh, psychologists, but then also just people to share, like sharing their perspective on what they've experienced. You know, judgments are really, really big things. So yeah. is there ways to kind of combat that um, to, allow, uh, to allow the cathartic process of, you know, reconnecting emotionally and, and being authentic, but then, you know, like what do you what do you say to someone who starts that process and then maybe they are ridiculed by their friends or worse, their yeah. family? Yeah, great, great question. So the 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 there's no shortcut to this, unfortunately. There's no magic pill we can take and we won't feel <laughs> judgment. The the way that we we deal with that is to get comfortable with feeling judged. Like if you want to do something either in a small way or in a big way in your world or in, in the larger world, you will be judged, you know, because, and it's not that humans are mean, we're, we're judgmental though. Like we're, we're always, we're, we're filtering everything, you know, our mind, part of what our mind's job is to put things into boxes, to categorize yeah. things. And so we will always be judged by people. And when we do things that are different or against what other people want, they will judge us for that. And so the best thing to do is to, to, to really, it's like we have to sit with that feeling and it's almost like we go through the feeling is the best way I can describe it. Like you, you sit in it and then you realize that actually it's just a feeling. Yeah. And actually then you can get to the point where you say, well, is it more important that my family and my friends like me and approve of me or is it more important that i'm living the life i want to live mm. and that's the question we get to and that's an individual journey for everyone um but but guaranteed if we're only doing things so that we don't get judged that's when we go into cycles of feeling like we're inadequate and feeling like we're you know, not doing what we can be doing. And we go into all these other things because we are limiting ourselves yeah. and we're picking up on that. As far as that comes back to the, you know, the process of uh, some of the work you do with Open Parachute and these, and these documentaries, it, it is creating that space to, to where it is more of a norm and you're certainly not getting judged. It's almost encouraged to be a champion of your own, you know, journey, if you will. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a really, really cool practice. For folks that uh, obviously work primarily, I just want to throw this one at you, work primarily with um, with the youth. For someone who's maybe tuning in and they're, you know, they're not in their youth, <laughs> whether they're in their maybe late 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever. Um, from your sort of experience and, 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 you know, the work that you do, is it too late? Like how much can, how much can people change is essentially what I want. And I feel like this question is always on my mind. I'm always throwing it at people because, um, yeah. Yeah, the whole nature versus nurture it. situation, right? Like yeah. how much can we, you know, make yeah, changes? I love it. So so I I really believe it's never too late and we can change absolutely everything. There's nothing that we can't change, which I know is a bold statement because of course there's limitations, you know, biological limitations and physical limitations, but in my experience when we get more, as we get more and more honest with ourselves, you know, that's what I've experienced in my life, at least, is that everything that I thought was a certain way, all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, that isn't even my reality at all anymore. And I was completely fixed in that belief or that pattern or whatever it was. And so I believe, I mean, when you first start this journey, it's a minefield. It's like when I first started therapy, I described it as it's like someone was just throwing crap in my face all day long because it was just like, <laughs> this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing. This is why you're crazy. This is, you know, blah. but once you get through that part, I, the journey then becomes really fun because it's almost like you get used to that letting go, that throwing away that like, which is scary. It's like stepping into the unknown, but you get used to that. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's, it's fun. Like, wow, like how is my reality gonna change? What else in my life is gonna fall apart? Because every time things fall apart, all of a sudden there's this whole new reality that, I'm, that, that you see. And so it's not that it's always fun. Like, you, yes, you break down. Yes, you're crying. Yes, it's hard. And then, you know, the next day you're like, wow, you know, what's this now? So 
And I believe that that's a lifelong journey. I think we, as long as we're breathing, we can completely transform, you know, mm. how we think, how we feel, how we act, how we show up. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you um, said that because I agree so, so wildly. And I talk a lot about on this show, you know, I always jump through the microphone or the screen sometimes. I get so passionate about that idea um, of neuroplasticity, right? Like how much the brain is almost designed to change. And yeah, sure, there's some, some sort of obvious limitations, but the capacity to which we can shift, you know, values, beliefs, like it's almost like we're going to, we're probably going to die before we run out of ways to change and optimize, right? So oh, it's yeah. almost futile to worry about <laughs> these things that are, yeah. you know, that aren't controllable, I suppose. And like mm-hmm. you were just outlining there, Haley, which I loved was you get almost like a small, uh, you get a taste of success when you do have a breakthrough. And then that mm-hmm. it becomes a cycle of like, yeah, I have made changes. Um, whether yeah. you know, even on a very obvious, t- you know, uh, superficial level, if you've ever, if people listening or watching have ever made any shifts in their body, good or bad, yeah, <laughs> lost weight, put on yeah. weight, you know, um, it just shows that we we are capable. In the same way with our mind, yeah. right? We can adjust all kinds mm-hmm. of things. And I think once you've had a couple of wins, and that's why I think it's so powerful to work with teens at an earlier age, where yeah. you, everyone's going to go through different circumstances and challenges and if you can get some early wins, you start to realize that, wow, I can actually do something about this. I think the the challenge is when you feel hopeless that it's yes. and everything's pointless. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And just on that, actually, do you come across some of the kids that you work with that uh, sort of come to you at that stage where they're like, you know, whether whether it is like behavior issues or, or struggling with anxiety and flirting with depression, like whatever their situation might be, they're, they're also burdened with this sense of, I just don't think yeah. anything's going to help. Yeah, absolutely. All the time. And adults too, you know, a lot of people I work with and myself too, I've been in that state of feeling like what, what's the point? It's, it's all too much. And I think the thing, you know, to keep in mind is that's actually a really normal human state. You know, we have mm. this, again, this dichotomy of, you know, mentally healthy people always feel excited about their lives. And it's, it's this, you know, depression or whatever we want to label it when we feel hopeless, but I think feeling hopeless is really normal. And so whenever we're in a situation that seems like it's too much for us, we will feel hopeless. And that can, you know, a logical thought in hopelessness is a feeling of, I want this to end, you know? So, so suicidal thoughts are really common, unfortunately, but all it means is, is I, I'm hurting and I don't know what to do. That's what that means. Right. And so um, definitely that comes up a lot. And so the best pathway forward is, again, we start where we are. We just acknowledge that feeling and honor it and normalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's okay. We've, We've been there. Most of us have been there in that state of what do I do? And then when we're honest about it, that starts to shift things already because it's the fight against that. That's part of it. What's wrong with me? I shouldn't feel like this. So we acknowledge the feeling and then we, we find what is one small step you can take. So again, it doesn't have to be, we're going to change your whole life. It's like, okay, right now you feel pretty low. You know, what, what do you want to do that would help you? You know, do you want to go outside? Do you want to talk to a friend? Do you want to hug? You know, whatever it is, we, we work with that one thing. And then just like you said, you get the taste of success. You know, it's like everything else you build on it. You take the smallest little step. Sometimes the smallest step is the most important step because you're starting to empower yourself. And when you empower yourself, you no longer feel hopeless because you've created hope. Mm. So is that, is that one of the strategies that you kind of suggest and implement in terms of like a takeaway um, is to, is to firstly identify like what, what's one small step that's going to be meaningful to, to that person, I suppose. Like I imagine there's probably some universal laws that, you know, work with most humans but because for the most part particularly as teens people are quite individual um yeah. is that one thing that you'd suggest is, quite, is to yeah. firstly identify what's actually going to bring you some level of you know yeah. joy fulfillment in the moment how do we kind of build more of that into into your habits is that a, yeah a, a, absolutely so i would say you first you first start with identifying what am i feeling right now and we make that okay so you identify that then the second piece of that if you can, is you identify, are there thoughts that are contributing to this? Am I thinking, I hate myself, my life sucks, you know, whatever. 
and then you identify those thoughts and you start deciding, okay, do I want to con because we can choose our thoughts, but we don't realize that until we start doing that. So we identify what is the feeling, what is the thought, then what is an action, you know, or what what is what is my action state? So, you know, our our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all in a cycle. So we just notice it where it is right now. What am I doing that's that's maybe not helping me? And then you can kind of go in at, at any way. So whatever is easiest for you. So if it's easiest to do an action, you know, or if it's easiest to think a new thought, or if it's easiest to, you know, just sit in that feeling until it passes, whatever you change in that cycle changes the whole cycle. Mm. So you can just, so it'll often when it, when it's depression, often the, the behavior is what's really helpful. So just do one thing, then notice how you feel, notice that cycle. And it's like, we're always, I feel like we can spiral down so much and we can just get into these downward spirals, but we can also turn that the other way. And mm. so you just want to figure out how can I turn that the other way? And then, you know, things start opening up. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think your life's a game of momentum, right? And if we're not moving, if you're not moving, then you're, if you're not living, you're dying. There's all kinds of, you know, throwaway um, platitudes, yeah. but they all, you know, they'll they all mean essentially what you're highlighting there. What I really like about your uh, the way you share, Haley, is um, like you've spoken about um, being able to uh, like sit in the feeling, right? like like you were just talking about there. And admittedly, like full disclosure, I've always consider that idea too passive and I've always wanted to do something about it right yeah. now I'm just going to derail for a second but then I'll bring it all back and I think this will Good, sort of yeah. make a make a point for people tuning in um admittedly as a as a teen as a young child you know I had some childhood stuff but admittedly I'll you know I'll, all can I was I did okay is essentially what I'm highlighting there <laughs> I didn't have any major issues you know I had sport I was never really bullied didn't have any dramatic self-esteem issues just had some normal stuff right that said, I then, um, you know, had a whole host of mental health challenges into my 20s, and that's a whole other story. The point I want to highlight is a couple of things. One, as a teen, I think I've lost my train of thoughts, to be completely honest, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I've lost my train of thought, but. You're never, talking about sitting with feelings. I was a good, I liked Oh, my point, goodness, so. of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the major point. So the <laughs> In that time, since the last few years, I've really trained myself to sit in those feelings. Whereas as a teen, even though looking back on it, I feel like I didn't really, you know, um, have too many major issues. I definitely started cultivating the habit of hiding from feelings. And for me, it was always, let me just go play footy. Let me just go do something athletic and move my body and change my state before I think about it. You know, things from my child, I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go party and have drinks or illicit substances or flirt with women. You know, any way I can get a quick hit of dopamine. Yes. And that served a purpose at the time. But then on reflection, it's like, holy shit, you get to, you know, 20s, 30s, you start becoming a little bit more reflective by nature. Um, and you realize like, oh, I'm almost trained myself to be scared of, of feelings. Yeah. And even if they're just normal feelings, like I've added, mm -hmm. I've created so much potency to them because I've been, you know, yes. sort of running from it. And that's, just, that's just one example. So I got there in the end. Um, yeah. but <laughs> is that, is that part of the process of sitting yeah. with it? I think yeah. I get what you're saying now. It's not, it's, it is yeah. a very practical process. Absolutely. And I love that story because it is, is perfect. It is, it is exactly what we all do. And so whether or not there's serious trauma, it's a cultural challenge that we are, we have trained ourselves and we are trained to just push it away. And there's so many things in our world that are convincing us that everything should feel happy and joyful and comfortable all the time. And so absolutely the process of sitting with your feeling, I mean, it, you know, it does, it sounds kind of like, what does that really mean? Well, it really literally means when you feel something, don't do anything, just literally don't do anything, just sit there and notice. And one of the ways that I find is really useful is locating the feeling in your body. So like, Often you'll feel something or, or I, I'm so quick to, to sort of discount my feelings. I don't even know I'm feeling anything. Like I'll just all of a sudden start rushing or being a bit snappy. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's probably a feeling there. I feel you there. But literally stopping and, and going, what do I physically feel? What is my sensation? Because a feeling is a physical sensation. It's just a signal that your body, between your body and your mind, helping understand what's happening. So you literally locate it. And, and I did a practice when I was first doing this where um, I would lie on the, on the floor. So my therapist had me like literally stop 
<laughs> whatever I was doing for periodically throughout the day and lie down on the floor for like two minutes. And just because I, I had such a hard time connecting to what was actually going on and just literally feel what are my sensations? What am I feeling? And it, because we're, we're so in our head and what that does is it brings us back into our body which is where our sensations are. And that brings us out of fight or flight, which mm -hmm. means that we're, we're actually clear headed. And then we can actually make a choice of what we want to do rather than being in that cycle of, I have to do this next thing because I'm, you know, unconsciously scared of what will happen what I'll feel if I don't. Yeah, that is super powerful. And funnily enough, something I've been exploring of late, I don't like it, but in terms of the, you know, like you having to sit with it, but man, sometimes like, you can pretty quickly realize, even if it doesn't feel overly pleasant in the moment, you, you almost always feel a little bit better afterwards, or you, you at least get a taste of this is okay. This feels like the right thing to be doing. To yes, like you said, yeah. get out of our out of our um, head, I suppose, um, and yeah. on a more tangible level, get out of the sympathetic nervous system, out of that fight or flight, yeah. Um, yeah. which is where a lot of people sort of spend their time, and you know that then yeah. turns into um, like an array of symptoms, which obviously you know turns into anxiety and all kinds of different challenges. Yes. So. Yes. Really, really practical tool. A couple more for you, and I'll let you. Um, I'll let you go. I feel like I could just you know, talk for hours, but um, so I love this stuff. Firstly, twenty twenty has been a crazy time for all of us. You know, laughing off air about the impact um, to different industries, but um, for you working with schools and, and with kids, what's been the impact that you've seen from you know whether it's the isolation or lack of connection, um, the lack of motivation and purpose, what's been the impact that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, it's such a hard time. It's a hard time for everyone, but I really feel like young people are hit especially hard because you know, the as we're, when we're young, our whole world is our social network. And so there's a huge impact just in the, just the feeling of isolation is one, obviously that, that sense of, being cut off from from the people that they care about um and then a lot of kids you know thrive in school because of the structure you know it's 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 very it's relatively rare to find kids that are sort of self-motivated because you learn that as you get older you know honestly I feel like I mean I've always been self-motivated but I think that was just because I was anxious <laughs> like Same. it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily because I actually, you know, had a motivation to learn. I just didn't want to get a bad grade, right? So, so there's, it's, you know, the structure, they've lost that structure. And then another piece of it is the, the sense of, you know, it's like when we're young, we have this hope, you know, we have this excitement about what am I going to do? And, you know, life is this, this big, wide open canvas. And that's really been taken away from young people because, mm. They, their world has been shaken up. I mean, it's similar to when my house was getting, was exploding, their world has exploded. So they have now as a whole generation experienced something where they have a total loss of control. Everything in their life has changed. They there's, there, there's things that they wanted to do that they can't do. So they're all going to be feeling a sense of, and they all do feel a sense of mistrust. You know, mm. I, 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 I don't feel safe. I don't feel like I can trust things. I don't necessarily have hope for the future. That's a, an undercurrent reality. So that's sort of the context. And then I, I like to say just the flip side, which is that one really positive thing that's coming out of this is that everyone's realizing the importance of youth mental health. And schools are really, for the most part, doing a tremendous job of really going, okay, wow, you know, kids can't learn if they're stressed, which was always the case, but this has just really highlighted it. So that's the, the, the silver lining, the positive that I'm seeing is that schools are really coming, you know, up, you know, really saying, okay, we need to, we need to help our teachers. We need to help our students. We need to help our parents. We need this to be a, a supportive environment and, and learning needs to be supportive rather than just here's the information. Yeah. For sure. And you touched on a couple of things there that you know, is where I wanted to finish things up today um, about like that, having that sense of purpose is, is what I'm hearing you say, right? Um, having a sense of like control to an extent, but I think a sense of purpose and meaning is probably a better way to explain it. And just to go back to, to my situation at school, I mentioned, I felt like I was in a pretty good spot psychologically. To, and I think if I reflect on it, it was because I had a really clear sense of at that time, you know, I want to play sports and I want to play football. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working towards. I've got this yeah. reason for getting up in the morning, if you will. Yeah. Um, 
and I felt like that period of time over was I often reflect on as my best years and I reckon that was the biggest variable was having a sense of hope if you will um, yeah. or a sense of purpose sense of meaning all these things um, that I see from afar at the moment some teens just don't have like whether they don't know what they want to do yeah. with their lives their career they don't know what their sort of values are what their personality is so mm-hmm. it's that lack of clarity um mm-hmm. when that's been taken away from me in the last sort of you know five ten years or so different patches that's when I yeah. felt the worst so yeah. for you is that something that you I don't want to put words in your mouth but is that something that you found is and something you help kids do is trying to reconnect to like well what is like how do we give you a sense of meaning how do we give you a sense of yeah. what you do matters something that what you do is going to excite you that you can look forward to yeah. um and, and if that is the kind like how do you actually go about doing that for someone because someone yeah. listening you know I, I joked at the start whether they're young or old um I yeah. feel like that would apply for everyone oh yeah for all of us and so and it, it's such a a great thing you touch on because really I also believe that that is kind of at the core if we if we feel like we're going somewhere or there's a meaning to our life we can overcome any challenge you know we're so resilient as humans and it's that that belief or that knowledge or that knowing really it's a knowing the purpose Mm. is a knowing it's sort of not a head thing it's a it's you know being you know feeling like there's something bigger going on and so again in my, my experience of this and what I see and what I witness and what I really build my programs around is that we only get to that knowing and that purpose through the feelings, you know, it's, is that, you know, so in my, my experience, for instance, in creating open parachute, you know, I, we start with a sense maybe of dissatisfaction or, or stress or overwhelmed, or I don't, I don't know what I'm doing or there's something missing. And so, so that's the state that I was in. And I, you know, you sit in that state and you go, okay, so let's, let's, you know, let's let things fall apart then let's let things, you know, let's really lean into that and feel, okay, I'm lost. I I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't feel totally fulfilled. And from that place, then you're in this really raw state and you create space and whether that's actually leaving your job, et cetera, or something a lot smaller, like taking a day to just be by yourself and to, you know, just sit with that and those uncomfortable feelings. And then again, you just take one action. So you, you know, from from space, from, from feeling, from rawness, from vulnerability, that's where inspiration comes. So then you'll have just a spark of like, hey, you know, maybe I wanna, you know, do that art class, or maybe I wanna, you know, talk to that friend I haven't talked to in a while. You just get these little sparks. And yep. so our, our, in order to, to sort of find purpose, it's all about creating the space, getting to, to ourselves through our feelings, through knowing ourselves, and then following those little sparks following the one leading to the next, leading to the next. And then we, again, it starts to build and then we start to go. And then that's, you know, where we're listening to ourselves and our intuition. And then we feel like, oh, I am on course because I am, I'm on it. You know, I'm not dampening myself down. I'm actually going towards what feels right for me at a deep level, not just in the moment because I don't want to be uncomfortable, but, but at a deep resonating level with, with who I am in the world. Mm. Yeah, that's huge. And I, that, there is so much to take from that. And I feel like that's um, just so powerful if, if, if we can all sort of really build that philosophy into our thinking. Um, and it's easy to, to agree on a surface level, but the more some of the things that we've spoken about and the practice you've, practice you've highlighted, I feel like the more we do these things, um, yeah. the easier, um, I guess, the more easily we connect to that understanding. Like we get it at a yes. logic level, but then how do we make that just part of who we are so we, anytime we're feeling in a state uh, that is not ideal we know what to do we know to sit through it we know to yeah. reconnect yeah. to a sense of purpose um and and yeah. realize that um you know uh and a lot of what the work you're doing highlights is that a lot of people are on their own journey so we're certainly not being judged um you yes, know when we are trying to process it. things right that's it everyone's on their own journey with it and and the only thing we can do is listen to ourselves and the only piece i'd like to add to that is just because when we start these things often the first thing that comes up is so overwhelming and hard. And so I just really encourage whoever's listening to, to stick with it. You know, when, when you start listening to yourself or, or wherever you are on that journey, you know, if you are listening to yourself and you listen to yourself more, every step we take on that journey at first, it really doesn't feel nice. (laughs) And so that's where we want to turn around again. And so I guess that's just another really big takeaway is like, 
in order to really transform your life, you know, you, it takes going through that ickiness, that feeling mm. of, oh, it's like the, you know, the first time you go for a run, if you're out of shape, that run does not feel good. Mm. <laughs> but if you do another one and another one, another one, then it starts feeling good. And so I think there's a, a bit of a belief in the self-help world that it should feel good to be working on yourself. And, and so it does, but it also doesn't. <laughs> it also right. feels really, really bad. And that's okay. That's part of it. That's a really good caveat to, to finish with, um, to, to make sure we do follow that journey and see it through. I really like it. Yeah. Hayley, thanks so much for your time today. I've learned heaps, which is always part of my objective with these charts and man, so much value for people tuning in. How can people uh, connect with you? Are you on social, yeah. website? How yeah. can we find you? Absolutely. So um, openparachuteschools.com is the website. Um, also on, um, uh, I think I'm on just thinking what my handle is on Instagram. Yeah, it's a Dr. Haley Watson. Cool. Um, and then LinkedIn, also Dr. Haley Watson. Um, and Facebook, Dr. Haley Watson. I'll find them mm -hmm. and put them in the show notes. Great. Great. Well, thank you again. Um, it's uh, We're talking off here, but it's evening there. Los Angeles time is where you are. Um, so you enjoy the rest of your evening and um, hopefully we'll connect again in the future. Sounds great. Thank you so much.